Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we cruise through the Catholic liturgy of the Word, trying to dig out the deeper meanings of Scripture and how they might apply to our daily living. Yes, my friend, that's what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down like a fraction. We're asking questions along the way, questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? They come to me each week and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world that, let's face it, doesn't know them for sure and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think? I mean, take a look around, my friend. There's a lot of bad news out there. How can I take the good news of Jesus Christ, apply it into my daily living so that I can become a light in that darkness, a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom? Not someday in some ethereal, far out, wishful thinking kind of way, but today and every day, and that's what this show is all about. And I'm so glad that you could join us today as we consider this gospel, and I love this gospel, on the 23rd Sunday of Ordinary Time. Got a great show for you today. Looking forward to getting into it. But you know, I, before we do, I, I got to tell you, it's been a bad week here. Bad week. I've had two very serious accidents. One that could have been really bad. The first one was I'm spraying for wasps. I found a wasp nest or a hornet's nest in the graveyard. And I, you know, I got the big wasp spray bomb thing and I went out there and it went all in my face. <laughs> so I was there like in my eyes and my eyes have been bleeding for like two days. And I, you know, I put water and I called the doc. He said, just, you, you'll be fine. Just put some water. You know, it seems like the doctors are never all that, you know, I guess they know. Anyway, the second thing, is I've got this bank right there in front of the graveyard, okay? It's pretty steep. And so I decide I'm going to run the lawnmower up the hill and then run backwards, you know? This is not a good idea, okay? Children at home, don't try this, okay? Because, yeah, you know what happened. I ran it real high, I got it up there, started coming back, and it got going too fast, fell backwards, okay? My back hits the the, the incline of the hill, and my neck snaps back and hits the driveway. I mean, it was bad, and my elbow started bleeding. Oh, and you know how when you get hurt, the first thought is, wow, that could have been a lot worse. <laughs> I could have died, you know? But, it was, but, you know, I got up, and I just, I felt sick, like nauseous, like really ill for just a couple of hours, because that's what happens when you get a concussion. And I call Connie, the, the, the secretary, who used to be a paramedic. And so she came over and patched me up and everything. Kind of like mom, she always makes you feel better. But anyway, so I'm a little out of sorts today, but never fear. We're going to bring it. We're going to bring it hard. We got a great show for you today. So what do you say? We take the time to quiet our minds and put ourselves into the presence of the Lord. You know, we spend so much time running here, running there, doing this, doing that. How often do we just stop and say, hey, what am I doing? Where am I going? You see, the good news about the good news is that God wants to lead you. And he does it in many ways through the quiet voice. But one very powerful way that he does it is through his word. Because you see, the Bible is not a book like a normal book, okay? It's alive. And it will speak to you if you open up your heart and ask it to do so. So what do you say we quit yipping about this and get right on into it, okay? Because we're going to school, my friend. Are you ready to be the student? Are you ready to hear the message? Do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? That is my prayer for you today. That is my prayer for me today. So what do you say? I quit yipping about this and we get right on into it, okay? I believe we're in the Gospel of Mark. Let's see. You know, we've been in Mark all year. Been taking some breaks lately with John for the Bread of Life discourse. But yes, we are back in Mark. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Again, Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee into the district of the Decapolis. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd. 
He put his finger into the man's ears and spitting touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened, his speech impediment was removed, and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said, he has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The gospel of the Lord. My friend, there's a whole lot here. This is a deep pool. So get ready because we're going after it, okay? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You hang out. We'll be right back. And we are going to talk about this gospel. And, you know, maybe even a few other things along the way. Here as we celebrate this incredible scripture that comes to us as the church celebrates the 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living got an email the other day from a lady who said that for years she's been going to church and her husband's been staying at home watching TV. Well, evidently he was flipping through the channels and found Daily Living. Now he watches it every week. And when she comes back from church, he starts telling her about the gospel that she just heard in church. Now she's so thrilled. And I bring this up to tell you that it is your contributions that give me the opportunity to reach that guy and the many, many, many more just like him that are out there. Now I'm gonna put up on the screen very shortly an address of exactly where you can send the check. I would ask you to prayerfully consider supporting Daily Living so that you and I together in partnership can take the good news to a lost world. Now what do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. So I got to say, you know, when you look at this gospel, it really does kind of highlight why we are so passionate of what we do here at Daily Living. One can make the case, and I'd be just the guy to do it, that this is precisely the, the lesson, the theme of this gospel, the motivation behind what we do, right? Which is, of course, looking for the deeper meanings of Scripture, right? And how we might apply it into our daily living. What, in fact, are the deeper meanings? So anyway, you know, I don't have children. Uh, that, that doesn't come as part of the package, okay? But my brothers and sisters, they got a lot of kids. And when you have kids, you tend to involve yourself in kiddie things. For example, you find yourself going to cartoon movies, which, by the way, is a big business. Studios such as Pixar, DreamWorks, uh, they churn these things out, right? So over the years, I have heard... And I guess it all started back with uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. You know, you know the show? I, I have no idea why anybody would want to watch the show. All they do is scream at each other. If you're not watching, you just hear it, like in the background. It's a little annoying, but kids love it. Anyway, years ago, I think this was the first cartoon show that somebody told me, that the writers intentionally weave adult humor into it, like historical references, things that would be way over the head of a child, obviously written for mom and dad, you know, pleasing the peanut gallery, as they say. So, and I've also been told that many times these cartoon movies, which of course are intended for children, actually deal with universal themes of all of us. But you gotta look beyond the story, right? And that's kind of how life is, I suppose. I mean, isn't it true? You gotta dig through the superficiality to get to the heart of what's going on. I mean, through the years, I've had many people come to me for uh, various issues uh, for counseling. And I understand, I'm, I'm accessible, I'm free, I'm all of that for sure, but one thing I'm not is I'm not a counselor. I'm just, I'm, I do the best I can, but counseling is an art, you know? It, it takes a lot of knowledge and it takes a lot of patience two qualities that I fear oftentimes I lack, okay? But I do the best I can. And the one thing that I've learned over the years in counseling is that people rarely say what they really mean. You know what I mean? People tend to talk around 
themes and issues. And the trick is to try to identify not necessarily what they're saying, but what are the underlying themes that are being projected here. And like I said, I am not good at this, okay? I'm getting better, but I'm not good at it. Because you see, the reality is that peefin, 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 people often are not angry at what they think they're angry at, right? And when you, when you get into a marriage counseling situation, well, you can just double your confusion, right? Like I said, I'm not so good at this. Because uh, I'm all about solution. I'm all about, I listen for five minutes and say, well, this is your problem. This is what you need to do. And that's all fine and dandy, but that's not counseling at all. You have to be willing to work with what the person is willing to give you, right? And then listen patiently in a very Rogerian way and, and hope that you can kind of lead that person to discover the answer for themselves because the truth of the matter is they already know it because it's inside, right? The answer is inside for all of us. The answer is within, okay? It, it's often not a function of really finding an answer, but rather the acceptance of what that answer is. Isn't that true? But anyway, in much of the same way with scriptures, you, you got to be willing to work with what it will give you. you. You can't project what your agenda is to Scripture, although I've seen it done many times, okay? you you got to say, what is this Scripture trying to reveal to me? It's important that I do not fall into the trap of infusing my agenda into it. Yeah, I know that we need a new parish hall edition. I know that, but do we have to drag out the talents to do it, okay? I mean, I... Look, that is a beautiful gospel, the talents, and it is rich with all kinds of secrets that have absolutely nothing to do with fundraising. But, you know, that's the first thing we think of it, right? And it's that low-hanging fruit. Let us not be content with low-hanging fruit. We got to work at it. The gospels do not easily reveal themselves. Take what it gives you and then drill down. Think of scriptures like a castle. Right? A big castle with secret rooms and undiscovered chambers and passages. And the thing about this castle is the deeper you go, the more beautiful the rooms become, right? And if you're really paying attention, if your spiritual radar is really dialed in, every once in a while, it don't happen a lot, okay? But every once in a while, the Holy Spirit will lead you into a great chamber that is so incredibly personal and so incredibly meaningful that you realize at that moment that God himself is actually talking to you personally through his word. I mean, one-on-one, -on -one, the ultimate Bible study. I mean, can you imagine? Like I said, it don't happen too often. I mean, unless you're Sister Faustina, okay? But Jesus, just a couple of weeks back, did say, they shall be taught by God. Isn't that true? We call this illumination. The Spirit speaks, and let me tell you, it, 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 it's rare, but if you're really paying attention, when it does, it's a gift, total gift. But you got to go after it. You got to dig hard. So with all that, let's talk about this. Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of uh, Sidon uh, to the Sea of Galilee to the district of the Decapolis. And people brought him a deaf mute man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. Now, on the surface, you have Jesus being confronted with this deaf mute, right? Which his friends, his friends, his friends bring to him and say, please, can you heal him? Okay, so, of course, Jesus heals a lot of people. So what's the big deal? Well, first of all, and this is a bit odd for Mark, because remember, Mark, he, Mark, I'm stumbling all over the place. Remember Mark, he's like the Joe Friday of the Gospels, right? I mean, he is just, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. He doesn't give you a whole lot of extra detail, but it seems in this particular story, he is providing us superfluous detail, describing how Jesus is, is leaving Jerusalem, going to Tyre, which is about 130 miles to the district of Decapolis, present-day Syria. Okay, now... Decapolis at this time is a Hellenized town. That means it's Greek, right? So they would be passing by, uh, well, principally um, statues of gods, you know? It would be a very odd thing for this band of strange Jews following their wonder healer, prophet, through this strange land passing, you know, the statues of Zeus and, and, and a, a Baal and Hercules and Dionysus and Venus and Pan and all that. But 
Let me tell you, they, they had heard about Jesus already because his, his reputation had preceded him. And despite trying to escape the crowds from where he's trying to get out of, he's into the Badlands now, and they know all about him. Of course, they know nothing about his masses, and they're not particularly interested in his Yahweh God, of which he spoke, but they heard he could heal. And I imagine some of them had actually witnessed it. And so here we are, Jesus is confronted with this deaf mute. Now I think our first clue is how he responds to this man who has a speech impediment. Because of course, keep in mind in the ancient world, and actually this continues in some places today, there is this notion that any kind of physical illness or deformity was a direct result of sin either that person or his parents or his parents' parents. Somebody did something wrong, and that's why he is deaf mute. Consequently, he would be viewed, this man, with great suspicion. And I imagine he had spent most of his life hiding in the shadows, relegated as a second or even third class citizen. Now, another sad fact about the deaf mute, and again, I think that this continues even today, is that people just assume that he's, well, retarded, for lack of a better word, or at the very least, simple-minded, and the world held him in contempt. Okay? That continues today. I mean, remember how shocked people were to learn that Helen Keller, which is probably the most famous deaf mute, and blind as well, was actually very intelligent. I mean, the very word dumb which is used to describe somebody they can't speak, speaks to that very prejudice. Now, of course, Jesus is confronted with this man, and he, he sees right through the guilt, he sees right through the shame, he gets it, he gets it all, right? And look what he does. He meets him where he's at, immediately takes him off, right? He takes him off privately, away from the prying eyes of the crowd. And you don't usually see this. Okay, he certainly didn't have to do that for this man, but you see, he's more than just a, a handicapped face in the crowd to Jesus. He he he's a person, you know. He's you, he's me. This is Daily Living on Father Chape, and you hang out. We'll be right back, and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we celebrate the 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Hi, this is Father Chapin host of Daily Living. What a pleasure it is to come into your home each and every week to spread the good news, but it's very expensive. Now I got good news and bad news. Good news is we got plenty of money. The bad news is still in your pocket. So if you'd like to help the ministry, please send a check to Daily Living at 325 West Main Street, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, 24986. And together we take the good news to a lost world. Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just before the break, we were talking about that deaf mute man, right? He's been brought to Jesus, and they begged him to lay his hand upon him. Now, we've talked about the fact that this, this man, due to his physical condition, had been ostracized from the people. He was considered defiled. He was considered unclean. He was not allowed in the temple, and he was doomed to a life of begging at the city gate. Now, he stands in front of the Prince of Peace, right? Jesus gets right in his face, looks at him intently, and it begins. Now, notice how he communicates with this man. He uses his own sign language, and there's four of them, okay? Number one, he puts his finger into the man's ears. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Jewish law, you would know that by merely touching this man, immediately he makes himself unclean, right? You don't touch that which is defiled. As you know, Jesus didn't need to touch him. He's healed many people without touching them. In fact, not, not, not too much uh, earlier than this gospel, um, he uh, healed a child that was somewhere else. He wasn't even, didn't even need to be there. So he certainly doesn't have to touch this man, but he chooses to touch the man's ears. Why? Because 60% of all communication is nonverbal. And through this nonverbal communication, he is saying very clearly, I get it. I don't think you're retarded. I do understand your suffering. I do understand your fear. I get it, okay? Number two, spitting, he touches his tongue. Now, this is a tradition of the ancient exorcists. Spittle in the ancient world was thought to have therapeutic properties, and I imagine it would. Once again, 
I asked, does Jesus need to do this with the spittle? Of course he doesn't need to do this. Once again, he doesn't have to do it, but he uses the sign language to communicate to this man, I'm going to heal you, right? I'm going to heal you. Do you think he's got his attention right about now? Of course. Have you ever had one of those moments where it became so intense that the world just faded away? Maybe you had walked into the hospital room and seen the baby for the first time, or, or maybe the one that you love gets on his knee and asks you to marry him in the restaurant. You know, whatever it might be, the intensity is so great in that moment that everything freezes and turns to blue. Can you imagine this man in this moment, his whole life? All those trials, all that suffering, all those fears, all that humiliation, all of that leading to this moment and then here it comes, number three, right? Jesus looks up to heaven, right? Now think about what's going on. This is a big song. What is he communicating? He's saying, I'm not going to heal you. The creator that spun all of this into existence is going to heal you. And every religion seems to be unanimous in suggesting that that creator's up there somewhere, right? Jesus is showing this man that God himself is going to heal you. Finally, we get to number four. He groans. And, and I got to say, that, 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 that just makes me want to cry, really. I mean, you got to figure that when you're deaf, you get pretty good at reading other people's body language. I imagine you get very well versed in reading you know, lips or facial expressions, and you don't miss a whole lot. Isn't that true? Watching the intensity on his face when he groans, what do you think that deaf mute was thinking? Don't you think in that moment he knew that Jesus not only understood, but felt his pain, right? Think about it. How else could you express such empathy with a deaf man? You groan. Looking up to heaven, he groans. He says, Ephatha, which means be open. And immediately the ears were open, the speech impediment is removed, and he speaks plainly. So, I mean, look at what's going on here, okay? This guy has never heard language in his life before. There's no speech therapy going on here, okay? So not only does Jesus allow this man to hear for the very first time in his life, but without any practice at all, able to communicate in a language plainly. It was pretty amazing when you think about it. It's impossible to escape the Pentecostal themes here. Remember, okay, Holy Spirit, when it rushed into that upper room on Pentecost, remember? Falling like tongues of fire upon the disciples, sound like a train, right? And those tongues started speaking foreign language. Not only that, they understood foreign languages as well, which is kind of cool when you think about it. So let's go deeper. I'm, I'm intrigued about the sequence here of the healing. Number one, his ears were open. Number two, his tongue is released. Number three, he speaks. I tell you what, if I could just get that one lesson. <laughs> if, if we could only learn to listen first, right, and then speak. Because, of course, nobody listens to anybody these days. And now everybody wants to talk. Seems like everybody's got something they need to say. But if we look at this we can see that it is the spirit that opens up the ears. It is the spirit that loosens the tongue. And if you don't have those two things first, you ain't got a whole lot to say, really. I mean, remember that old saying, a still tongue makes a wise heart. The wise old owl sat on an oak. The more he listened, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard, why can't I be like that wise old bird? Isn't that true? Jesus said a couple weeks back, quoting Isaiah, Isaiah, what does he say? They shall be taught by God. That, of course, is true. But what if we're not listening? What if we're merely skating on the ice of superficiality and we never take the time to go deeper into what it's all about? What if we never take the time to look up, how can we hope to hear anything? My friend, Jesus was face to face with this man, had his hands on him. Hear me when I say 
He patiently waits to be face to face with you. This man showed up with bags packed, suffering and fear. Jesus looked up to heaven and he groans. Hear me when I say he's groaning for you. But understand this. He's not going to show up at your church and save a congregation. No, he doesn't save crowds. He saves people. But you got to look for him. It's intimate. It's personal. And it is only when you get into his presence that he can look at you and say, Ephatha, be open. Be open to what I'm trying to show you. Maybe this week we can ask ourselves this question. Am I open? Do I have ears to hear? Do I have eyes to see? You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.